this is all about is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the God's children. Our guest today is one of America's most thoughtful, most honored, and most controversial filmmakers, Oliver Stone. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You know, one of the things that strikes me about your career is that no one ever says your work is substandard. The criticism is always that it's too good, that movies like JFK and others mislead people, that, that, that you might create um, misimpressions about what real history is all about. Um, it's a different kind of criticism of, of somebody who makes movies, isn't it? Totally different standards. The JFK movie is, it, it was a hypothesis, and it was always stated as such. To say that it falsifies history is, is, a, is an erroneous claim because the movie never sets out to say that it is history. Right. It raises the question of uh, what is reality, more likely. What is reality? Why do we buy certain things? It makes us rethink what we hear from the state media and rethink it. You've had a a remarkable career and it seems but like there's I have to say yeah. one more thing I'm sorry to interrupt you no problem just because it's an important thought that you talk about respect from them mm -hmm. towards my work but you let you neglected to say there's also a very strong portion of the reactions are not even our silence mm -hmm. and no reaction uh, so I find myself sometimes strangely enough having built up a, a record of work to be denied denied, uh, the, the films are not even seen. I've become a non-person in a way. I want to talk about that. I, I'm curious, though, about JFK, because it seems to me that, you know, you've got all kinds of credibility in the industry, everything, you know, from Midnight Express on, you're a, you're a hot commodity, a talented guy. And with JFK, it's almost like a fulcrum there. I mean, that's the one where I think you took the biggest beating and the public perception of you shifted. Is that your sense of things? I would say it? that was a watershed. Yeah. And why JFK as opposed to, you know, other fil films you've done? I don't think I even realized at the time how, compli how deeply the picture addressed the f a nerve button for the country, not just about the conspiracy uh, to kill the president. That becomes, a full cr that becomes a litmus test of whether you're conservative or liberal. So you don't have in any intelligent discussion about what actually happened that day. It's about are you a conspiracist or are you not a conspiracist, which is an ultimately boring question. As far as I'm concerned, two people sitting down for dinner are conspiracists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they, it's the nature of life. Uh, but uh, the bigger question that you ask is, eludes me. What was that? Well, <laughs> the whole issue of why it was JFK as opposed to other films, which, which also had tough subjects. Was it something about JFK? I mean, you later did Nixon and got oh, negative reaction to it. But yeah. it, was it something about Camelot that made that a particularly... Well, because I think in the larger sense, it just questioned American history. Yeah. Who is George Washington? Who is, uh, what is the American Civil War about? What was World War I and World War II about? And it started to open up that whole area. I noticed that Eric Foner has a book coming out called Who Owns History This Year. That was a comment that I kept saying at that time. Who owns history? Right. We're the upper class. With the, and they, uh, they, the, the press is bought for, and they basically uh, are limited in, what, in their response to anything. They, they, they box everything in their categories. So it's very hard to really have free, free speech. I don't expect free, free speech to exist anywhere in the world. That's utopia. It's all relative. And America is better than most countries. Uh, Athens was better than, they say, uh, Persia, but you know, Athens was very uh, contentious. People were driving each other out of exile. So there was never f pure free speech, I don't think. And yet you've had, I mean, you've had your way with free speech for, for decades. You've made movies that said what you wanted to say. Being criticized for it is not... Nixon was, uh, I pulled back a little bit on Nixon because I was scared. Natural Born Killers, after JFK, knocked me for a loop again. You know, I had set out to make an action summer movie and it turned into a parody, a satire that was condemned and reviled by it and misunderstood. So that really knocked me for a loop. And then on Nixon, you know, I, you, know you get gun shy. Let, every, we're all human. Mm -hmm. I did say things about Nixon, I felt, but I found myself again there being prejudged as I was on JFK. The Nixon people condemned the movie wholeheartedly without even seeing it, mm -hmm. including the children and, and Disney's daughter because it was Disney release blasted the film, so it hurt us. 
the sad part is when you see the movie, those people who like Nixon uh, may find that he is much better in the movie than they think. Mm. And whereas those who didn't like Nixon hate him anyway, and they won't go to see the movie. So very few people went to see the movie. And, and more distressingly, the press reaction was so muted. Some critics, literally, I can tell you, you won't believe this, but of the, let's say, 100 critics in New York that go see movies, they run checklists of who, who, who came mm -hmm. when they show it in New York. And I was surprised at the amount of people who didn't even bother to see J Nixon and fled from it. Like it was, oh, no, I don't want to get involved. You actually pulled your punches on Nixon? There are things A you little did bit. Not. Can you give an example of that? Well, I think the best example would be that Anthony Summers, who wrote an interesting, uh, actually a very interesting book on Marilyn Monroe and another interesting book called Conspiracy on Kennedy, Irish uh, investigative journalist, wrote uh, a Nixon biography that came out in 98. 99. It was ignored by the American press, totally ignored. They, they wrote about the scandals, they wrote about him beating his wife, taking drugs, which is sensationalist tabloid stuff. But the real scandal of the book is the true behavior of Nixon on, the, on nuclear matters, international matters, being drunk, being, dr uh, being drunk and being out of control. Uh, power, uh, Sum Summers goes much further than my movie. And if you remember, I was lambasted for having Nixon uh, drinking and uh, slurring and using dirty words. Well, the, the recent transcripts released through Cutler's efforts, Stanley Cutler's efforts, have revealed a man who's far more profane mm. than any character I drew. And if you, I was criticized for that, right. but there was no apology. I've been right on a lot of stuff. What's odd is that your, your films, all, you know, they get challenged for a lot of reasons, particularly you create scenes that none of us can know whether they're exactly they're true or they're hypothetical scenes. Um, and yet, I think there's a good case to be made that you're a revisionist in terms of history, and, and virtually every generation of historians have revisionists. That's what they do. They rethink what the previous generation of historians um, said. Why? Not quite right. I always define myself as a dramatist, doing a historical a drama, which is quite legitimate, and it's been done for centuries, and I don't know why I'm held to another standard as if I'm a documentarian. But I try to keep to the spirit of the truth. A lot of research goes into it. Uh, who knows what happened behind closed doors with Nixon and Kennedy? You have to go inside and use your imagination. But you should be based on research and, and a thorough knowledge of what he might have transpired. Uh, I, I never consciously sought to distort anything. Have you I ever thought any? to combine, condense, okay. make it work, but stick to what I think Nixon meant? And what Kennedy's death meant, et cetera. So in JFK and Nixon, you never put a scene in that you knew to be untrue. That's not the same thing. Okay. I, I put in a scene in Nixon where Dean and uh, Hunt meet on a bridge. That was untrue. Okay. But the fact was that the truth of the matter is that uh, Dean paid money to Hunt through lawyers. Uh, so there's always go-betweens. But you don't have time in movies to shoot all the go-betweens. So, and the telephone calls, so what do you do in a movie? You make the choice. I said, well, I'll put them on a bridge together, and I'm going to have one pass the money to the other, and blah, blah, blah. So is that untrue? Yes. Is it a distortion of the truth? No, because they, uh, uh, Dean gave money to Hunt. Mm. So that's the question. I've never seen anybody, any filmmaker, spend as much time discussing your work in as thoughtful a setting. I mean, if you go back and look at clips and articles, there are 32-page articles in which you're doing Q&As and responding to the, the community of historians. Yeah. I wanted to mention this book, Oliver Stone's USA, published by the University of Kansas uh, yeah. Press. This is a book in which a lot of prominent historians criticized, uh, provided additional perspective on your work. And also and, praised. And praised, and then you responded to it. Right. Which, uh, and, and you feel good about that volume. I put a lot of work into it. I, I worked, uh, I gave up almost a half a year. And, uh, you know, I wanted to put it down on the record because it's so much has been distorted. And we should talk about distortion is, mm -hmm. is just as damaging to censorship uh, as uh, it's just as damaging to free speech as censorship because distortion rules. The media has, um, can't get any story straight. Was it historians uh, or the media distorting in your view? Both. Uh, uh, Stephen Ambrose is shameless in his distortion of what I said in Nixon. And many of the JFK people, in repeating that I have a scene where JFK, where Lyndon Johnson uh, acknowledges shooting Kennedy, are, are not watching the movie that I made. Uh, it's very clear that 
conspiracy to kill him that is depicted in the movie comes from a small clique. But they were obviously a powerful clique. I don't know who did it. I'm hypothesizing in this movie. I know you've been criticized by people who said you're teaching an entire generation of false history. <laughs> Howard Zinn wrote me a beautiful letter. He's a great historian in his way. Many people disagree with him, but he said, you know, the art is subversive, it's emotional, it raises, it challenges the official truths of the establishment. And he says, how the hell can you posit that anybody comes to a film with a blank slate? What are they, stupid? They were uneducated by the state? Everybody comes to the JFK movie, if anything, buying the 20 years of propaganda we sustained from the Warren Commission. Uh, so I'm fighting against a huge lie to begin with whatever poor weapons I can manage to make people think about what they read, think twice. All of my victory is to make people think. Uh, that's all. No, no harm in that. Socrates' uh, idea is the same thing. And why can't films be more Socratic? Most American films right now are really in a rut. Mm -hmm. They're buying into this militarism. They're buying into this easy uh, answer to all questions. It's very depressing to me because uh, all my films, all my body of work, ultimately, if you think about it, including Natural Born Killers, was intended to make people not only enjoy the movie, but to think about it. Mm. Are there topics you would like to make? I would have liked to have done Martin Luther King. It was a character study. And there, you talk about pre-censorship. This is a lot of that goes on. As you know, in JFK, Washington Post pre-censored the movie, as did many other mm. Time magazines. Meaning, meaning what? Well, they sent a reporter to the set mm -hmm. who had a stolen first draft of a screenplay. Well, we were working on the seventh or eighth draft when this guy showed up. Now, that's not fair. And then he completely tore us apart in a Sunday article, huge article, mm. based on the first draft. Um, I'll give you another instance. What happened to me, the FBI guy, a monster, in my opinion. His name is, uh, he worked out of the New York office. He came after us when we were doing a TV thing on TWA. I don't okay. really want to talk about that. He, that. And he was quoted in the New York Times saying I was a scumbag, blah, 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 profiting off the, uh, uh, the grief of the victims' families. And the grief of the victims' families, we interviewed 100 witnesses who were never interviewed by the FBI. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, the, the grief of the victims' families is basically from his attitude is, you know, shut up. You know, you heard the story, it's over, here's the flowers, here's the funeral. For those, I feel sorry for him. Those for those people. who ha are not familiar with it, because it made a brief splash. You had a deal. Was it ABC? Was it yeah, a brief splash. You raised a good question. On Friday afternoon, I got a call from the Times. I got about 20 minutes to respond to a complex issue uh -huh. about what's going on. And I don't know what's going on because the network is shifting very fast. It took three days after the FBI agent spoke. The network caved completely. And this is, I'm talking about everybody at the network knew that I was making this, except the top, top dog. Suddenly, three days later, you're canceled. So I, I have no, uh, I can't interpret history, but something happened. So this is the story of TWA Flight 800. Yeah, which is a sham. And, and you call it, I think the title, working title was Oliver Stone's Declassified, was that right? Yeah, it was part of a series that we were doing for, a very provocative series we were doing for ABC. Uh, about all, it's called disinformation. It's about the, the, the way the media spins the world from ABC through all of them. Mm -hmm. You get a pro-American, America first ethnocentricity that drives most people around the world nuts, mm -hmm. which is why Americans don't understand why there's a lot of fundamental dislike for our arrogance, ethnocentricity. But uh, in this case, uh, uh, It was just, it was never aired. What would we have seen on that show? It, you would have seen uh, the opposite of 60 Minutes. You would have seen three or four segments a week. Tick, 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 where we went at it a completely different way by letting the real people talk, not putting the spin on it. But we would not have, uh, I mean, if it had been on the air, would we have any new insight into what brought the plane down? Of course you would have, because the witnesses are the ones who would have brought the insight, not me. There was actually, helicopter pilots saw it go down. Rocket engineers, people with very mechanical skills who understood what they were seeing. It's a very disturbing, very disturbing. And as the media conglomerates, gets smaller and smaller, it becomes more disturbing, more Orwellian. And, and, 
I do see a ministry of communication. I mean, the government is coming in. They are, uh, the, all, when all the American, the, our, all our boys, you know, all this fuss that the media made about American Hollywood supporting America, it's a very dangerous co uh, collusion uh, of forces. I think these people have to see the America from outside in to understand how dangerous this game is. You've had some strong words about what you describe in terms of media control of the information we get. I think you've, you've used the words fascism in terms of uh, media and government together uh, controlling what we see. Definitely. Fascism is described uh, classically as the corporate control of the state. You know, you could argue that we're pretty close to that right now. Enron is just one tip of the iceberg, but the corporations have been the big players. And the, the lobbyists, they've driven out the younger, the, the personal individual lobbyists. But I'm curious, I mean, you talk about the press sort of being controlled or controlling, and yet you've known, I'm sure, many reporters in your life. We're good. Free spirits, aggressive Absolutely. people um, who are pursuing the truth. So where's all this happening? Is there a... A filter at it's corporate happening. headquarters? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a big... What are you talking about? Every time Magazine Guy for years was rewritten by New York. There's an editor in New York, Washington, who rewrites everything. The editors control the story. I've had so many stories, interviews cut or omitted. Mm. I'm shocked. And the, uh, the reporter has always come back to me sheepishly and said, I tried, I really wanted that story to play, but they just they give you economic reasons. They always give, You never know the reasons. Mm. The reason is because you said something that pushed a button. And they don't like that. And that goes on with me a lot. But I'm sorry for the kids because I'm glad that South Park kids are doing what they should be doing. But we need more. Uh, oh, boy. We have to think differently. How do we think differently if we're educated by a model in which America is God's nation? Mm. How, do I, how is that going to work? Mm. We're self-deluded. America is the center of the world. It isn't. You know... You've tackled a lot of tough subjects. Never, to my knowledge, religion. Have I missed that? Is that a topic you're... Yeah, that's a tough topic, isn't it? Yeah. Have I you think ever... I'm going to do the Mary O'Hare story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think she's an interesting lady. She had a crazy life. Yeah. The fact you're doing documentaries now, does that mean you will never do a major motion picture again like Nixon or JFK? No, not at all. Okay. You know, I, there hasn't been a chilling of, of investors because of the... No, no. I mean, uh, it's all how you do it. You know, if I wrote uh, the script and it was brilliant, I bet you people would line up. You have to be smart. You have to be smarter than the system. And uh, unfortunately, it's harder for me because I'm very so spotable, you know. Mm -hmm. I can't change my name and, and do another film under another name. But uh, I will never give up, and I love big subjects. I'm doing Alexander the Great right now. If we can work it out, we're trying very hard. Uh, it's a great subject. One of the first international universalist believers in mating the races, in finding world government. Uh, interesting story. And so he much, was uh, s stopped. That's, uh, it's fascinating because so much of your work is truly from from the 60s on. You reflect on I mean, platoon and yeah. and all, and so much of your work is Time driven to go back and see the whole. Yeah. Right now we're in a stymied position. We're about where we were with the 80, 80 to 85 period in the arts, I think. I think there'll be a breakage by 2005. I think we'll get bored with Bush. Hopefully most of the uh, sitcom audience will. <laughs> and uh, maybe we can move on. I think there'll be a break. Things change. But we're definitely in a uh, retroactive period. Were there dynamics in Nixon's story that m made that... Oliver North is working again. Yeah. He's back. Yeah after jail and lying and all the things he did. He's back as a commentator at Fox. And doing very well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, were the dynamics in Nixon's story that made that a workable as a movie? I mean, would Reagan's story be a film? I think Reagan's story is a great story. Uh, it's a great story because he, uh, he was a great communicator. And damn it, the man was charming. Mm -hmm. He had an Irish thing about him. I, we made a movie about him called The Day Reagan Was Shot right. for Showtime. Uh, Cyrus Noatash wrote and directed. It was, very little money. It was brilliant, though. I urge you to watch uh, Richard Crenna and Richard Dreyfuss. is superb. Work. Very well done. I'd like to talk to you about Natural Born Killers because it's a, it's a film that uh, provoked strong responses, as all your movies do, but also provoked litigation. Um, there is a, a lawsuit. Uh, there's a lawsuit filed against you in Louisiana uh, after a, a, a person was a victim of a crime that they said was inspired by uh, two young people watching Natural Born Killers. 
Uh, what was your reaction when you first heard that your art was uh, being accused and, and uh, being responsible for this grave injury? Well, I, no, the press was, it's interesting, the uh, New York uh, so-called, quote, liberal intelligentsia was uh, calls and after me, for, and I participated in one unfortunate article in Vanity Fair. And the, the reporter was a typical liberal in that he tried to divide the responsibility between me and John Grisham. Mm. Grisham had started the whole thing by saying that movies should be outlaw, but should be judged as, uh, as if they were defective products, industrial products. In other words, you could sue a movie maker uh, in the same way you could destroy, you could f uh, sue a, a car company for making a defective Ford Pinto. Very serious uh, mm. idea. Mm -hmm. making art into uh, a material idea uh, that you could be sued. So uh, at stake was quite a lot, and nobody seemed to be aware of it because nobody in the media wrote about it except two or three people in very obscure places. It was a serious law. The Supreme Court turned it down, went on for five years, six courts. It's still going on, but it, we thank God we finally had a major victory. And uh, after spending one to two million dollars, Warner Brothers and myself doing time with the, uh, all the litigation, all the waste of energy, you know, what, you have to ask yourself, what if it was a smaller company? How would they defend themselves? There's no way. You see, we expect litigation to cost a billion dollars. It's insane. As a result, the R, the, the R-rated movie, whether it's my movie or Matt and Trey, it, it, is in jeopardy because uh, the lawsuit issue you know, can only be handled by big companies. When you first heard about this. And by the way, just to answer sure. specifically your question, right. the positions on natural born killer and my responsibility, I denied responsibility. I said, how can I take half responsibility with John Grisham? Hmm. Or how can I take half responsibility in any way? The kids were screwed up for, for years. They took drugs. One of the killers, the, the, the male, admitted that the girl was making it up, hmm. blah, blah, blah. And they, were, they had a history of psychotic episodes. And my point is, the Bible you know, forced John Lennon's killer, whatever. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter what your spark is, but they, the, the issue was distorted in the media. The media, it's a better story if Oliver Stone and Warner Brothers are half guilty or guilty, or run the, then just, well, this is a ridiculous suit. We should laugh it out of the courts. Mm. So it was simmering for a long time, and a lot of money and time was wasted. And to be clear, you won on traditional First Amendment grounds. Finally, right. after six courts, do you know how much paperwork is wasted? Oh, sure. And the money and the time, the depositions. It's a, it's a bloody movie that you intended to satirize, in which you intended to satirize bloody movies. No. No? I you, satirize you want, much more than that. Well, society and you name it. But uh, Listen, the whole culture was screwed in that movie. But the it violent was, culture. It was a satire, and a satire in the sense is not is outsized. It doesn't mean funny, necessarily. Some people may not find that movie funny. I don't care. Satire is just outsized, grotesque, exaggerated, so as to make you think. So here we have the classic two killers. They killed 60 people. But even worse than them is the, uh, is the uh, warden and the media, uh, Wayne Gale, his desperate search for profit. And of course, Tom Sizemore plays a perverted detective in a way the state becomes worse than the killers. I think that really angered a lot of people. And then the killers get away at the end. That was the icing on the cake. I was dead meat. <laughs> so what is your take on violence in films when it's not being used as a vehicle for satire? I mean, th th there are a lot of violent movies being made, not all of which are art, or high art, I should say. I is, it too, is it too violent? What is? Uh, the, the culture, the, me the popular culture, which would be the Lieberman argument. Um, you've had some strong words for the senator. Oh, Lieberman, and uh, yeah, this is very dangerous because by taking away the R rating, they took away the NC-17. That belongs, that was the adult category. That was quite, li what happened was that the uh, Walmart people and the, the usual conservative elements in the South and so forth started to come up with the concept, great concept. Oh, the, we can't get a lease in the insurance, uh, in the mall because of the insurance company because we're running NC-17 porno films. It's not porno. That was another category. Hey, NC-17 is adult. They stole it from us. We're the American public. We have the right to see NC-17. You cannot see sex in America with any significance or the way we can see it in most developed, civilized countries. And violence is given more play than sex. 
So, and yet we don't want too much violence, mm. as, we, as we certainly don't want too much sex. So we're really screwed because we're a culture like the Romans in a sense that we're not showing our, the full range of human activity. We're, 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 it's fascistic means corporate control of the state. In a corporate situation, nobody misbehaves. They get fired. Everybody's scared. There's no boss. Who owns my company today? Yeah. So there's this sort of conformity, this fear. And fear dominates the American social and cultural landscape at this time. After, what, 10 Academy Award nominations and three wins, uh, uh, you, uh, you've got a wonderful track record. And you have almost always used your art to say something. But there have also been times when you've said, you know what, I think your quote was, I can't always lead with my chin. Um, are you wearing down? Uh, I, I fought a lot of battles. I think, I, you know, it's, I think you save yourself uh, now that I know more and have much more experience. If I would be stupid not to uh, rethink everything a little bit more, but not hopefully overthink it. But if there's a battle that I, I can add something to and is worth fighting, I should still do it. Okay. We can't do justice to your career in 30 minutes, but we sure enjoy talking to you. Thank here. you, Ken. Join us next time as we continue our discussion on free expression and the arts. For more information about Speaking Freely, visit our website at www.speakingfreely.org.